morning, everybody. Welcome to New Life. So good to be with you and for those who are joining us online. Let's sing. Marco Island, Florida, and enjoy this snow with you folks today. Hey, the Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're so thankful for your attendance and for those that join us online. We welcome you. Let's also give it up to our ushers that clear off the sidewalks and make this place where we can worship the Lord in safety. We thank God for you guys. And uh, as we go to the Lord, just a quick reminder, next Sunday, 2 to 4, uh, sort of like New Life Next Steps, New Life Orientation, uh, New Life Ori uh, Overview, whatever you want to call it, Pastor Michael's going to be leading a seminar, 2 to 4, right here. There will be social distancing, but uh, if you've never gone through that, it's a great opportunity to find out what New Life is all about, the values we embrace, uh, the foundation we try to uh, build the ministry upon, and I know that Pastor Michael will just do it outstanding job with that and we look forward to that sitting out probably stop in and, and just say hi during the seminar at some point but uh, we won't steal your thunder and uh, let's give it up for this uh, staff and all that they do here as well let's go to the Lord in prayer father in heaven Lord we're so thankful that you are the God of, of all creation and Lord we thank you that we can worship you 
And Lord, celebrate your goodness and enjoy all four seasons. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. Lord, the strength that you provide. Lord, we thank you for the, just the opportunity to worship you. Lord, I pray for everyone that's here this morning, those that will be coming to the second service, those that join us online. Lord, I pray that the service would be a blessing. And Lord, we just pray that it would be an encouragement to all. Now, Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful day. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Welcome. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. No, oh, his love for me. Yes, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free.
Welcome to our folks that worship with, with us on a weekly basis online. Sydney and I, the last two Sundays uh, while we were in Mark Island, Florida, we worship with you online. And Pastor Michael and Jake, what a tremendous job. We, we sent those services out to all of our Facebook friends. We'd encourage you to do the same. But we just chose, usually we visit other churches while we're in Florida, but we just chose to sort of do a, 
abundance of caution this year and with this great online opportunity we just joined you folks and we're right here with you at new life and what a blessing it was and we flew out of uh, chicago straight shot to fort myers we weren't sure if we were going to fly and then rudy said my pastor why would you drive if you could fly and i said well we're a little nervous about the safety and he said you'll be fine wear those n95 masks that he provided and rudy had given us each an n95 mask uh, when this first began we wore those all through the airport all through the flight and uh god kept us safe i also kept my kim crest hand sanitizer in my pocket give it up for rudy if you appreciate him i'm gonna ask nick belotta to come up here would you nick just hustle right up here god bless you and while you're making your way uh tim and tammy i know you're proud of your family and you have every right to be that this is one outstanding young man and nick uh had a little time off uh, from iu uh, bloomington and he's been volunteering and helping us out here at New Life. And Nick, what a tremendous job. I understand you're an elementary education major. You've got a bright future, Nick. God has gifted you. Most importantly, you love the Lord. And Nick, you have a servant's heart. And I just want you to know that did not go unnoticed. He landed a helping hand in a host of different ways, everything from teaching he cleaned uh, the auditorium one time when we needed it uh, helped us out on the sound and so forth for a couple of funerals here at new life whatever we asked nick to do he did and i want you to know too he did it with an absolute tremendous spirit positive spirit not only do you have a humble heart and a servant's heart you have a positive spirit nick i want to tell you something that is like a magnet people will be drawn to you and they are drawn to you i just there's a verse of scripture that comes to my mind first timothy 4 12 says let, let no one look down upon your youth but be an example to the believers in word in conduct in love in spirit in faith and in purity nick that verse embodies where you are in life nobody needs to look down upon you you are an example of the what a believer ought to be at this stage of your life and we just want to say thank you. Here's a couple of gift cards that you use those down there at IU. Uh, treat your sweetheart, too. I think it'll be a blessing. But I want to have a word of prayer for Nick. And let's give it up for Nick. What a tremendous young man. We love you. God bless you. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of worshiping today. Lord, I pray for Nick. I pray your just hand of blessing all over his life. Give him a bright future as we know that you will. Lord, as your word says, whatever we do, do it heartily as the Lord, not to men. Lord, I thank you that that's the spirit that Nick embraces. Thank you for Tim and Tammy, just the tremendous parents that they are, and the example to this flock of just a, a godly home. Now, Lord, I pray for Nick as he goes back to college. Lord, just have your blessing upon him. Use him in a mighty way in a campus that needs the salt and light of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we give of our tithes and our offerings at this time, Lord, both online and mailing it in or at the offering boxes as we enter or leave the building, bless the offering as well. And again, we just pray your richest blessing upon Nick in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. We love you, Nick. Go with God, buddy. This is my testimony, this is 
is my testimony We come together sons and daughters We bought with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yeah. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I've testified by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. Dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. No. Greater things are still to come. This is my testimony from death to life. Just grace you wrote my story. I'm dead. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. We ask, Lord, that you just speak to us through your word this morning. Lord, thank you for those who have made it here in person and those who are gathering online, Lord, and we just ask that you would speak to our hearts the way we need this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if there is one thing that never changes in life, it is that everything changes in life, right? Everything changes in life. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a business, uh, constantly different new leadership or hi, new hires that come in. Schools rotate teachers and even principals. Um, you have new classrooms of children every single year. Everything changes. Teams move players up. You get new varsity players. You bring new players in and you train them up and they raise up and they become the new varsity players. It's a constant changing thing. Families, even families, they grow in size and then they age and then the children leave and then they have children and so families change. Uh, television shows, they eventually run out of writing material so they change as well. Um, even things of the faith, churches change. Pastors change. Music changes. Everything changes. Music, uh, ministry method changes. The only thing in life that truly does not change, the only thing, and I find this very interesting, everything in life changes, everything. The only thing that doesn't change is God. It's interesting that God, who is timeless and changeless, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, created the world and the universe in which everything does change. As if to say, if you're longing for something stable, the only thing stable is Him. So in a, in a world where everything changes, and there's constant change going on in our life and in our world, the question is, what do we do with the change? When things change around us, we have a choice. We can either quit or we can carry on even just this past march we're coming up on a year of a global pandemic everyone found themselves in a position businesses restaurants churches schools everybody found themselves in a position how will we function in a society that has been shut down do we quit or do we carry on? God wants us to carry on. God does not want us to quit. He doesn't want us to quit on Him. He doesn't want us to quit on His mission, which is changeless. 
the Great Commission, God wants us to carry on. So we're going to see today, as we conclude the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to take a look, and we are actually going to see how Timothy is charged, not just charged, but commissioned by Paul. As if to say by Paul, this is not the end. God buries his workers, but his work continues. Timothy, your life is changing because I will be leaving it. The church is going to change because the churches that I've planted with you, I won't be around anymore to help lead. But the mission continues. So Timothy, the choice is yours. Quit or carry on. So we pick up today, just to recap, just the past four chapters, Timothy is charged with courage. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He's told to be unashamed because God will keep that which was committed to him by Timothy until the day he meets Jesus Christ. We're told to be loyal, guard what has been given to us, and then give it to others. We're told to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We're told to have an eternal perspective, to turn the word of God loose in our life. We're told to build power in life by diligently doing the hard work and studying the Word of God. We're told that there's a two-minute warning. This is how we'll kind of know the signs of the times. These are the things that are going to happen. So be someone who who is faithful and someone who is worth following and is faithful worth following. We looked at the B-I-B-L-E, how the Bible in chapter 3 tells us it is holy. It points us to salvation It is trustworthy and profitable. It equips us to fulfill our ultimate purpose in life. We're told how we have a strong order. And that is, uh, as pastors, to preach the Word. And as people, we should look for the preaching of God's Word. And listen to it. And then last week, we took a look at competing for the crown. Compete for the crown of Jesus Christ in our lives. So that brings us to our final passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 9. Would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word this morning? There's a lot of names in this, so bear with me. All right, here we go. You ever feel like that when you read the Bible? Oh boy, there's some names here. This is going to get exciting, right? Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world and has, t- and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, and, and Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful, useful for me in ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work, and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus, sick. Trophimus, wouldn't that be a nice name? Anybody looking for a name for a child right now? Do your utmost to come, to come before winter. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. You may be seated. So what are some things that you and I can take with us from the final kind of charge, if you will, from Paul to Timothy? Now we know that this was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about inspiration, God breathing through men, His written word. So we know that it was written to Timothy, but the intention was it for it to be a circulatory letter. So yes, it was going to Timothy, but the goal was not only should it be used in Ephesus, but it should be used, sent and copied and sent to the churches that Paul planted. So not only was this a letter to Timothy, but it was meant to be a circulatory letter. So what are some things that we can draw out of this today in 2021 in January after we've just shoveled ourselves out of eight inches of snow 
to drive here, or we've gathered our family online, we've disciplined ourselves, we've gotten up, we've got the coffee, we're ready to go. What can we take away from this final charge? I would encourage you to think of this. Number one, live, but live for Christ like your days are numbered. Live, but see, everybody says, yes, carpe diem, seize the day, let's live as if there, you know, we don't have tomorrow, it's never guaranteed. Yes, but we should live for Christ as if our days are numbered. Okay, so one of the things that I think is important to point out in this passage is the Apostle Paul makes it, he, make, he draws attention to time. Over two or three times, he draws attention to the idea of time with Timothy. He says to Timothy, be diligent, he says, to come to me quickly. See, the Apostle Paul knew, he knew that his time on this earth was, was fading. It was actually going to be wrapping up pretty quickly. So he says, with it, with it coming to an ahead, and you know, they're, they're going to try me again, Timothy, if you don't come to me quickly, I might not get to see you. So the Apostle Paul was very aware that his time on this earth was, was wrapping up. And so time was of the essence. And so if time was important to the Apostle Paul, because he didn't know what tomorrow held for him, he, you know, you and I ought to, to think the same way. He also says to Timothy, he says, come before winter. Well, why winter? What's the big deal there? Well, if he didn't get on a ship and sail to Rome before winter, the storms would be too much. They would not be able to sail, and Paul was pretty sure he wouldn't make it through winter. Paul knew his days were numbered. Paul made great use of his time. Here he is in prison, facing the end of his life, and he's writing these important words to Timothy. In fact, when you see the Apostle Paul and you see most of his life, whether he was in prison or not, he tried to maximize his time for Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, he, he knew that life was not forever. It's just for right now. So I wonder what would happen if Christians today, if we chose to live for Christ as if our days are numbered. What would that look like? You know, whether we believe it or know it our days are actually numbered psalm 139 tells us before there was one of them all of our days were fashioned before us before there was even one the lord knows our life the lord has created our life and he has numbered our days in fact psalmist the psalmist in psalm 90 and verse 12 he says this Teach us, Lord, to number our days so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. So the psalmist tells us we, our days are numbered. And then another psalmist challenges us, says, teach us to number our days. You know, how much better would we be with our days if we not only knew they were numbered, but then we taught ourselves to number our days. You know, there are only so many days I'm going to get to live in this life. So I'm going to use them in the best way possible for the Lord. I'm going to do my best. The reality is, we live in a time where what we want is we want a, a risk-free world, and that's true. We, we, boy, would that be nice. But Paul, is, it's interesting here, he says that the Lord preserved him. He was delivered, and the Lord preserved him. So, Paul knows he's probably not going to be delivered from the next trial, but from the trial before, the Lord preserved him. So the Lord has something more for him to do. That's the idea here. And maybe it was to write this letter to Timothy that could be circulated through all the churches, and the Holy Spirit could use it in churches all over the world forever and ever, just like today. Maybe that was the reason. But whatever the reason was, the days were numbered because God gave him the days. God allowed him to have more time. Paul was actually invincible until his work on this earth was completed. Paul stood before the most wicked emperors, Nero. If you want to do some world history, read some of the, the terrible things that Nero did, not just to the Christians, but in general in life. He had no regard for anyone, not even his own family. Having family members, even his own mother killed. I mean, just a, a wicked, evil man. Paul stood before him with courage. He knew his days were numbered, but he knew the person who held his days, and that is God the Father. 
He knew who was in control. So when you and I, if we were to choose to live our lives as if our days were numbered for Jesus Christ, I wonder how that would play out. Maybe we would speak differently to one another. Maybe we would use our time with our children a little more different. We would use specific time to impress upon them important matters of life, really hone in on what we want them to grasp and hold on to and take with them in their lives. Maybe we'd enjoy the simple moments just a little bit more. Maybe we'd feel stressed less and just a little more blessed. Maybe we would live like eternity was in full view and we knew eternity was coming, but we made the most of right now. Maybe. Maybe we'd look a little different. Maybe we'd act a little different. Maybe we'd talk a little different. I think when you think about the concept of living like your days are numbered, there are three things at the beginning of the year I think every Christian says, I'd like to do better in. I think I'd like to do better in my finances, Christians say. It's the beginning of the year. We're going to start new. We're going to set some goals. In order to achieve certain goals financially, what do you have to do? You have to budget. But a budget is not restrictive, it's actually freeing because it allows you to fully engage those resources and to feel guilt-free about how you're using them in that capacity because you know that if you use them this way, you're accomplishing your goals financially. A budget is freeing. There's another area that a lot of Christians try to really hone in on at the first year, and that is, I'm going to make some, some lifestyle changes. Well, that's where a good diet actually is like a good budget because what it does is it makes you free to feel like, well, I can eat these calories at this time and enjoy this time because this fuel for my body is going to help me and I'm going to achieve these lifestyle goals. There's also spiritual goals that Christians set. And Christians set these spiritual goals and maybe they want to read through the Bible in a year. Maybe they, uh, they want to spend more, they want to attend church more, they want to up their church attendance. Uh, maybe they want, to, there's a lot of things that Christians will want to do. They want to grow closer to the Lord. Uh, they want to be faithful in their walk with the Lord. And so, man, what if we applied the same mentality towards our finances and our lifestyle? What if we applied those to the faith and towards our time? You see, when we budget our time, it allows us to fully engage in the moment. We fully engage uh, our family when we're with our family. We don't let other things take us away. We fully engage the Lord when, we, when we've set aside that time for the Lord, and so we can just pour into the Lord at that time. We fully engage our, our work life when we uh, set aside that time, and we're, we're there, and we're present. We're not thinking about this. We're not thinking about that. See, budgeting our time as if our days are numbered, what it does is it frees us to be fully useful in every area, and it allows us to grow. You see, we ought to teach ourselves the best we can to number our days because our days are numbered. And God himself has planned our days. So how are we going to use the days that we have? None of us have an unlimited budget of days. That's coming in the life to come. So you have so many days, so many hours, so many moments. How will you use them? I'd encourage you to write down number two, restore people in life. One of the things that the Lord would encourage you to do, life is short. There's only so many days, so we might as well not spend them arguing and fighting. We ought to try to restore people in our lives. And he, t he says, go get Mark, for Mark is useful to me. This is just a simple little phrase, but it has such significance, such great impact eternally because what happened was if you go back to acts what you can read is there was an account that happened the apostle paul was on a missionary journey remember how paul used to go out on a missionary journey he used to go out with barnabas there used to be paul and barnabas and they'd go on these missionary journeys and they took mark with them and other disciples as well but there was one instance where mark actually left them he deserted them he ran for cover we don't know if he got scared or got upset or whatever but he left he deserted them and left Paul in the lurch. And he was like, man, this guy defected on us and we cannot take him again. So they're headed back out onto another missionary journey. And Barnabas shows up with his cousin Mark. And it, basically, this is the essence of what happens. The Apostle Paul looks and he goes, absolutely not. 
And Barnabas goes, no, 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 he's coming with us, Paul, because he is, he's my cousin, I want to take him. He goes, no, that man left us. He is not coming back with us. He left us in the lurch. You know this, Barnabas, and so do I. We can't take him again. Barnabas gets upset, and he says, no, Paul, you don't understand. And see, Barnabas tries to pull rank with Paul because Barnabas was the one that brought Paul into the faith and kind of vouched for him and did different things for him. And so Barnabas tries to pull rank with Paul, but the thing is, is the Lord's anointing was on Paul, and so Paul says, absolutely not. Barnabas, this is not going to happen. Barnabas, you're not bringing Mark with you. So either you come uh, and Mark stays, or you and Mark are going on your own. And so it says the contention got so hot that Paul and Barnabas split. And what was once Paul and Barnabas became Paul and Silas. And Paul went on his way with Silas, and Barnabas went on his way with Mark. Here's the thing, though. We never hear about Paul or Barnabas again. We only hear about Paul. We don't know what happened to Barnabas. We do know that Paul, in his last days, says, bring Mark for he's useful for me in ministry. It's almost like, as it, now we don't know, maybe Barnabas had gone home to be with the Lord, maybe he was Mark, we don't know. We don't know what happened with Barnabas, but we do know Mark was sent for. We do know Mark was sent for. And Mark was a young man. He would be like Timothy. It's almost like the Apostle Paul is saying, bring Mark. He's from the next generation. I want to restore him. I want to make sure he can carry on. Carry the mission on. He's grown in his faith. He's grown in his wisdom. Okay, let's bring him. I want to restore him. So in our own lives, we have people that obviously we don't get along with. That's no secret. It's no secret in our nation right now. We are so split. It's unbelievable. You watch the news. You watch your social media. You read the, you read the articles online. It's no secret that we are a very polarized country secularly speaking so it's not different in the church people are very different they have different views people are going to see things differently but if our days are numbered why should we spend time fighting with one another when there is a mission at hand so the question that we have is Who in your life needs to be forgiven? Forgiveness is easy to talk about. It's harder to do. But those who do forgive and those who do practice forgiveness experience the freedom of joy. They do. They experience freedom from the things that hold them back. They experience the freedom from the bitterness, the resentment. They experience that freedom. Who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt to? Who in your life do you need to maybe go and see in in the days of pandemics, maybe FaceTime? You may not be able to knock on their door. Try to restore the best you can. That's all you can do. Life is too short. Days are numbered. Try to restore people. I'd encourage you to write down that not only should we try to restore people in your life, this seems kind of, uh, kind of like the opposite, but we also should not let people destroy God's work within you and through you. On one hand, we want to restore people. On the other hand, life is too short to let people destroy us and destroy God's work in our lives and destroy the work that God's doing through us and the work that God's doing around us. Life is too short for that. He says, Alexander the coppersmith He did me much harm. For the Apostle Paul to talk about someone doing him much harm, I mean, that's somebody who really, I mean, the Apostle Paul is going to give the benefit of the doubt the best he can, but somebody who did him much harm, it's it's somebody who did a lot of craziness. This is probably the same Alexander, even though it was a very popular name back then because of Alexander the Great, Uh, but Alexander was probably the same Alexander that he turned over to Satan himself in 1 Timothy. He, he, this man did him so much harm, he turned him over to Satan. He says, here he is. Obviously, that didn't work. And Alexander is still alive, so the Apostle Paul knows he's losing his life, and he just wants to make sure Timothy doesn't get so impacted by him as well. There's two different theories that they believe that Alexander did 
the Apostle Paul great harm. They believe that, the, that Alexander was probably part of the Ephesian uprising, and he was a spokesman. Uh, he was kind of somebody who defected from the faith and then became a spokesman for the Ephesian Jews who were trying to stay away from the uh, Ephesian Christians because the, the Ephesian Christians were being viewed in a certain light, and it wasn't always positive. So the Ephesian Jews wanted to be separated from them, and so he became a spokesman, kind of like casting and, sh and, and, and uh, shouting accusations against them in a great way that got the crowd kind of against the Christians in Ephesus. There's another theory, and that is that the Apostle Paul stood alone. And see, in those days, when you had a trial and you went to court, what would happen is, before the Roman court, the Supreme Court there in Rome, is they would give people a chance to come and testify on your behalf. Now, here is the Apostle Paul, who has reached probably hundreds of thousands of people for Christ by this time, and not one person comes to his defense in Rome. But some believe Alexander showed up. And Alexander was public about who Paul was and he threw all kinds of crazy accusations against him stopping him from being released from prison now that didn't surprise God God his Paul's days were numbered even though it was evil that was taking Paul down it was ultimately in God's design and God was going to use it for his glory and for his purpose and his ways however humanly speaking here is a man who was being used by Satan himself to try to take the work of God down in one of his greatest workers during this time. Paul warns Timothy, be careful. Be aware. Alexander is wicked and evil. And I don't know what your translation says. Mine says, uh, you know, may the Lord repay him. Almost like as if the Lord is, as if he's praying to the Lord, kind of an imprecatory prayer, kind of like, hey, uh, may the Lord repay him evil, in, in essence. That's actually not the best way to read it. The best way to read it would be, the Lord will repay him. The Lord will repay him on that day. The Lord will repay Alexander. The Lord will repay him for the evil that he has done. The Lord will repay him for the wickedness that he has sowed. The Lord will repay him. The Apostle Paul knew this. So we want to restore people in our lives, but at the same time, we don't want to be naive. Because there is real wickedness around us. There is real evil. There are real satanic powers and presences. You know, 1 Peter 5 says, Be on the alert for your adversary. The devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the, the devil, uh, Satan himself, is not omnipresent. A lot of us kind of think that, but it's, it's not that way. Only God is omnipresent. Only God is all-powerful. Only God is all-knowing. Only God is everywhere at all times. That is only God. Satan cannot be God. Satan is not God. He is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all the time. However, Satan has legions and legions and legions, and that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of demonic fallen angels at his disposal that he uses to do and to carry out his work. And these fallen angels, these demonic powers are present in your life. They are present in the lives of people around you, and they want to bring you down. There's one goal, and that is to bring you down in this life. To discredit the Lord's work in your life, just like Alexander tried to discredit Paul's work in his life. So there will be people in your life that are actually doing the work of Satan, whether they know it or not. They're doing Satan's work in your life. So we must be careful. Don't be naive. We want to restore, but we also, life's too short to let people destroy the work of God in us, through us, and around us. So, what else do we pull out of this passage? I'd encourage you to write down number four. We're never alone. Never are we ever alone. Never. If God is all present and, om and omnipower, he, he is everywhere at all times. And in a time like COVID, where people have been more lonely this year than they have ever been, people have been trapped they have been confined. Children are unable to go to school at times. This has been a very challenging year for a lot of people and one of the most challenging elements 
of this entire pandemic is the loneliness of people. But we are never alone. There is never a moment in your life where you do not have God by your side, the Holy Spirit, empowering you and strengthening, strengthening you just like the Apostle Paul. It says in verse 17, the Lord stood with me even when no one else would. All forsook me, but the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. So what? So that the message might be preached fully through me to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul knew that the, that the Holy Spirit, that God was with him. That the Lord Jesus Christ, it strengthened him and gave him the power, even when he was alone in the presence of this incredible, wicked power in Rome, and he knew that there was no way that he was walking out of this court. He knew that it was the end for him, and yet the Holy Spirit empowered him to preach the gospel in such a powerful way so that it would be made known to all the Gentiles, even to those in Rome. Paul was never alone, and neither are you. You are never, ever, ever alone. God stands with you. The Lord Jesus Christ empowers you. The Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom and the strength to do what you need to do to proclaim God's glory in your life and so that you can be used to share the message of the gospel to those around you. Jesus will do the same for you as he did for the Apostle Paul. Christ is beside us. We have the peace of the Lord in our lives, even in the hardest of circumstances. We have the strength of Jesus Christ to persevere. We have character, wisdom, and power through the Holy Spirit. And he says, I've been preserved from the lion. That lion he knows is Satan. I've been preserved. In your life, you're never alone. And you will be preserved from the lion when you rely upon the Holy Spirit and his power in your life. One last thing. Live intentional and pass the faith to the next generation. Live intentionally and pass the faith to the next generation. Ultimately, the mission of the Great Commission, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is not Paul's mission. It is not Timothy's mission. It is not anybody that he mentions in here's mission. It is not any of the, it's not all of these different names. It's not even Mark or Demas's. It's none of those. It's, it's none of their, their mission. It's not Pastor Mike's mission. It's not my mission. It's ultimately the Lord's mission. And we are workmen and, and we are in his mission. Now we make his mission our mission, but it's not our agenda. It's his agenda. And what we do as servants of the Lord is we take part in his mission. And so we trust that as we become workmen in his mission and with him, what we trust is that as we do this, that no matter what, God may bury his workers, but his work continues. And so as we pour ourselves into the work and the mission of Jesus Christ and his church, because it's not our church, it's his church. Yes, we belong to it, so it's ours in that sense, but he's the owner, not us. It's his church, the global church, the local church. It's, the, it's Jesus Christ. It's his mission. It's his church. It's his gospel. And we participate in it. And what we trust is as we are faithful in our part in his mission, that we are passing the faith to the next generation. Paul lived intentionally. He lived intentionally in all of his ways. You can, you can read about it in Acts. The different epistles. He lived intentionally in how he met Timothy. That's how he trained Timothy. That's how he equipped Timothy. And now that's how he's going to live, leave Timothy intentionally for the Lord. I can only imagine that the Apostle Paul, as he's penning these words, is almost like a father. Because he calls Timothy the son in his faith. You know? And I just imagine him like a father who's thinking of Timothy. And he's probably having these flashbacks. He's probably remembering young Timothy as he met this young teenage boy with Eunice and Lois. How he saw Timothy trust Christ and took him on his first missionary journey and gave him his first task. I imagine the Apostle Paul maybe sitting down thinking about the first time he heard Timothy come back and share that he led somebody to faith in Jesus Christ and how he taught him how to preach and to preach the Word and I imagine the Apostle Paul sitting there thinking about how 
when they went on these journeys, how he was able to give the, Timothy more and more and more responsibility. And now thinking of Timothy as the man that he is today, there would be no more mentoring, no more visits, no more time. But because Paul was intentional in his life, Timothy was ready to take the next step. That's what God wants for all of us, to live in an, in an intentional way so that one day our children, one day our grandchildren, will be re ready to receive the baton and to take the faith to the next generation. So the question is, what can we do to live intentionally? Well, I would encourage you, church attendance counts. It does count. So, if you gather in person, never, ever, ever, ever look lightly upon the discipline of being together as a family on this day and setting it aside. If you gather online, never, ever, ever, never, ever sell short what you are doing by bringing your family together and emphasizing this time for the Lord. Church attendance matters. Your morning and your evening discussions with your children, they matter. Your car rides to and from different places, they matter. What you talk about and what you pass on, they matter. We want to make them all count for Jesus Christ. So what can you do? Make a plan. Make an agenda. Set a goal for your church attendance, for your youth group attendance, your children's uh, ministry attendance, your quiet time, your Bible reading for your kids, your discussions at the dinner table or even later at night as you talk about different things. Set aside the, the resources and the time so that they can participate in camps and Bible school. And we believe that one day that's going to happen again. We do. It's going to happen again. Set aside time for verse memorization and help them memorize their verses. Demonstrate it to them by sharing with them a verse you recently memorized yourself. Helping them memorize something and showing them what you've recently done goes a long way with your children. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We do not pass it to our children through the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed to them to do the same thing or else one day we will spend, spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States to be free. We all get that when it comes to freedom. What if we applied it to the faith? What if we said we are all just one generation from godlessness? We do not pass the faith through the bloodstream to our children. It must be done through hard work, sacrifice, giving of ourselves, or else one day we'll tell our children's children what it was once like to have a nation that believed in God. There's a lot of talk about political parties. The reality is, those who love the Lord, we're seeing a generation where there's been a miss. There's been a miss in the handoff. We've traded the preaching of God's word for those who will tickle our ears. We've heaped up for ourselves people that we want to hear instead of those who we need to hear. And as a result, not only are churches paying the consequences, not only is the, the, not only is the, the, the religious in our country are we paying the consequences, but I would argue our country is paying that consequence. God's people must be intentional and carry on and pass the baton. So the question is, what are you facing today what is it in your life you will need to carry on from what is it you are being faced with where you're saying boy if it, i'm either going to quit or i'm going to carry on i do not know what it is for you but i would just like to share with you i i know you know this but nine years ago when my brother went home to be with the lord it was a very challenging time in my personal life in our whole family's life nine years ago right now that was a very foggy time it was very it was different it was difficult right 
People say, well, what was it that was so difficult? Well, he was not just my brother. He was a great friend. He was a cheerleader in my life. Many people didn't know this about him. He was always uh, kind of behind the scenes with me. He actually, I believe, believed in me more than I believed in myself. One of my favorite conversations that I had with him was one night. We were just out back sitting on the deck. He had come over and uh, uh, Jody and um, Jamie were talking inside with Bella. They had brought a present over for Bella and Joseph and I just kind of slid out on the back deck. It was nice on, on a September night. We were just having a heart-to-heart conversation and he just said to me, Michael, you were born to preach. Just kind of came out of nowhere. That was a very hard talk. Just a few months later, he's gone. So nine years ago at this time, you find yourself in a, in a fog and you find yourself walking through this challenging time. So what do you do? What are, what are we going to do? Well, you eventually say, well, I, I don't know. I either press on or I quit. I either carry on or I stop. God buries his workers, but his work continues. Well, I, I'm still here, so God's work is still here to be done. God, God still has a plan. He still has a purpose. He still has a place. And it's just like we heard sung in the song, as long as there is breath in our lungs, if I'm not dead, then God's still got a plan, right? God's still working, so we must carry on. That's what we see with Timothy. We all face these scenarios in our lives. Maybe it's the loss of a, of a, a family member, just like myself. Maybe it's the loss of a friendship. Maybe it's the loss of a job that you never saw coming. Maybe it's the loss of your health that you just are, it's bewildering to you. You don't know how it happened, but it did. There's so many different losses in our lives. And every one of us has faced one, two, several, or we're facing one right now. God would say, don't quit. Carry on. Carry on. God's work is still here to be done. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, maybe you're here today or maybe you're joining us online and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior or you've gotten away from the Lord you want to just affirm your faith in Jesus Christ. Right where you are, would you pray and just say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you and who you say you are, the eternal Son of the living God who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Believing friend, if you're here today or you're joining us online, is there something in your life that you're facing that you feel like I'm being faced with this quit or carry on scenario right now, Pastor Michael? Talk to the Lord. He wants you to carry on. He wants you to give it everything you've got. If there's breath in your lungs, he wants you to live for the Lord. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of the Apostle Paul and of Timothy. Lord, may we apply all of these truths to our own lives. Lord, may we be used of you in a powerful way. Lord, in your work right here in Mishawaka, Osceola, Granger, South Bend, Elkhart. Lord, may we be used of you right here. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you And holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. How we live. enjoyed our look at 2 Timothy, and I know that I primarily preached that to the 1030 uh, service, so if you want to watch any of the previous chapters that we preached, we started on October 4th, and if you don't want to go through all the Facebook feed to try to find them, you can go to the website, and you can go to nlpositivefaith.com, click on the media, and you can scroll through the videos there if you want to watch and you want to learn any more from 2 Timothy uh, in that way. Pastor. Amen. Well, if this has been a blessing to you this morning, give it up for the Lord, would you? We're so glad to be back, and that was a tremendous sermon out of a tremendous series, Pastor Michael. And it was an encouragement to me just to listen to you. Thank you. Would you pray the Lord's Prayer with us this morning? Our, Our Father, Father, who art Lord in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, be done on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be dismissed. We're so glad that you...